Good morning. My name is Pastor Matt of Liberty Baptist Church in Dyke, Iowa. I wanted to share a few thoughts with you from the Gospel of John. Uh, today we're going to be looking at John chapter 7, the whole chapter. So if you're watching this uh, online and you can pause the video, go ahead and do that now and read John chapter 7. This passage is a, a, an account of Jesus standing before many people that wanted to have him killed. And it reminds me of one of my favorite Bible stories. That is Daniel and the lion's den. Of course, I'm sure you are familiar with the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel is facing adversity. Uh, King Darius had him thrown in uh, a den of lions overnight. And everybody expects the next morning for Daniel to be completely chewed up and killed. I love teaching this story to kids, especially kids who have never heard it before. And like VBS, I have opportunities to, to share this story with maybe kids for, who have heard it, hearing it for the very first time. And I love trying to build the drama of the tale and watching their faces as they cringe thinking about this 80-year-old man who's going to be chewed up by lions, but then God steps in, shuts the mouth of the lions, and Daniel lives and Daniel survives. In John chapter 7, we see Jesus in the lion's den. These aren't lions that Jesus are facing like the lions that Daniel faced. The lions that Jesus is facing are not muscle-bound, fur-claden beasts. They are richly garbed, religious Jewish Pharisees that are deeply hypocritical, that love religion rather than they love God. They are the wicked religious. Today we're going to see how Jesus handles the lions of his day. And hopefully as we do so, we're going to see how we should handle adversity in our day. How we should handle opposition, trials, and trouble in our days. We're going to look at how Jesus handles the lions. And we're going to ask ourselves, how should we handle the lions in our lives? First of all, let's examine the, the lions that Jesus is facing. Let's look at the accusation of the lions. First of all, I want you to understand that these Pharisees, they were people that took the, the words of Scripture and twisted them to serve their own purposes. So think of televangelists that are obviously greedy for money or people that are preying upon other people in ministry, that they're trying to get rich, they're trying to control people, you, you've, you've thought of those types of people, I'm sure, uh, in the past. The Pharisees were kind of like that. They took the scriptures and added to them all these laws and all these rules that people couldn't even bear. And they made a, a point of being very proud of how religious they were. Whenever they drank tea, they would filter it through a cheesecloth just in case there was a gnat in there or something like that. Uh, because that's an unclean animal. And they're really just going out of their way to show how religious and how spiritual they were. They would tithe on the uh, herbs of their garden. They would count out nine leaves for themselves and one leaf for the temple, uh, for the treasury at the temple of the Lord. And they would add to the law, which was already a, uh, a burden of, of for men to bear. They would add to that all sorts of other laws in order to prove how religious they were. And they hated Jesus because Jesus was constantly calling them out. Jesus was constantly letting, uh, calling them hypocrites, calling them a brood of, uh, of vipers. He was constantly telling them that they are not keeping the spirit of the law of the scriptures. They don't care about mercy or justice or love or peace or grace they only cared about rules and being more important than everybody else. They were self-righteous to an extreme. And they accused Jesus of many things. Among them, on this list, verse 12, that he deceives the people. Verse 12 says, And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good, others said no. On the contrary, he deceives the people. They would say things like, uh, like, you don't know what you're talking about. You're leading the people astray. Today, Christians face the same sort of adversity. 
We see a world that is always telling us that we're wrong. We see a world that's telling us that to, to believe in science and evolution, to believe in the, the, the theories that make up the scientific community, including the Big Bang Theory, theory of evolution, all these things. And if you reject that, you're some fairy-believing, unicorn-believing uh, goody-two-shoes that just rejects science altogether. In other words, we're deceiving people. But we know that the God of heaven is the God of the scriptures who has given us his word. But they're claiming that Jesus is deceiving people. And we see that still today. They claim that he was not educated. And because he's not educated, he was leading people astray. Look at verse 15. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters having never studied? How does this man know letters having never studied? Another way of saying that is how can this man uh, be, be so well articulated having never been educated? Because remember, Jesus is standing in the temple teaching from the scriptures. So this is something that usually only rabbis would do later in life and after having gone through rabbinical universities. And so they're saying, how is, how is it that he knows to, to read the scrolls to, uh, from the Torah in the temple? And how does he know to teach these things, having never attended a rabbinical school or university? And because of that, you shouldn't listen to him. You shouldn't believe what he says, because he, he's not well studied. Now again, we see that today. You, Christians hear accusations of, you are rejecting science. You are rejecting years and years of evolution uh, and, and facts that we, that we know for sure. But the truth is, it's all based upon theories that cannot be proven. If you really believed we evolved from a rock, I know that's simplistic, but that's essentially what atheists believe, that we all came out of absolutely nothing, that life just appeared out of absolutely nothing, and then that life became more and more complex over time to what we get to today, which, by the way, takes a lot of faith to believe in that. Uh, yet we get accused of believing uh, in, in God by faith, even though it's very reasonable when we look around the universe, we see intelligent design. Surely there must be an intelligent designer. We see things that are very complex. It must have come from an intelligent mind. And so we still see the same sort of accusations today from people that, that Christians are deceiving other people, that Christians are, are not educated. They have their head in the sand. The lions in Jesus' day accused Jesus of having a demon. Uh, verse 20 says, The people answered and said, You have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Jesus had, had said in verse 19, Moses gave you the law, yet none of you keep the law, and you're seeking to kill me. And so they said, What well, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you? Now they accused him of having a demon, which is a very big accusation. Jesus is from God. He had literally spent eternity past at the he right hand of the Father. And they're saying about him, the righteous one, the only righteous one, that he has a demon. What a profound accusation. What a profound sin. And he says, or, or the, the people say, why do you, or Jesus says, why do you seek to kill me? And they say, who is seeking to kill you? Who is seeking to kill you? But over and over in the Gospels, we see that people are trying to kill Jesus. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 7. After these things, Jesus walked into Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. In verse 10, it says that he wanted to go that way in secret, not in public, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Because two chapters ago, in chapter 5, go ahead and, and turn there with me. In chapter 5, we see that Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. And because he had done that on the Sabbath, excuse me, because he had done that on the Sabbath when you weren't supposed to do any work on the Sabbath, verse 16 of chapter 5 says, For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Now, Jesus knows the hearts of men. 
he knows that they wanted to kill him. And he mentions that. You, you are seeking to kill me. And they said, you must have a demon who is seeking to kill you. But yet it is a theme throughout all the Gospels that the Jews are seeking to kill Jesus. They are seeking to have him not just put away, not just shunned, not just taken out of town, run out of town, or even put in a jail. They are seeking to have him killed. Now imagine that. They are seeking to have him killed. This is the, the, the religious people of the day, the leaders of the day. They wanted Jesus dead because he was revealing the truth about who the Pharisees were, revealing the truth of God's plan for the lives of the people. And it doesn't mean that doesn't that plan doesn't include following the Pharisees. It includes believing in the Son of God. And it was a new doctrine to these uh, Pharisees of Jesus' day. So they wanted to have him killed. That is wild. No, no, no thought of compassion. No thought of, of righteousness. No thought of love or peace, but murder. Remember when Joseph, a righteous man who was betrothed to Mary, found out that Mary was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Before he knew that it was by the Holy Spirit, he wanted to have her put away quietly, not have her killed. Joseph was more righteous than the Pharisees. They wanted to have him killed. Imagine if you or I were able to go back in time. Imagine we had a time machine and could go back in time to, to Jesus' day, to first century Jerusalem, to speak with the Pharisees, and we made some bold claims about ourselves and our own righteousness, imagine how that would be received by the Pharisees. I imagine you went back in time and were able to say, I, as a Christian, as a believer, as a saved individual, born-again Christian, I have the Holy Spirit that is God living inside of me. Now, how would that be received? Let's set aside the, the question of if I went back in time to before Acts chapter 2, before the Holy Spirit came, would I still have the Holy Spirit? I'm not sure. But imagine if I went back and I made that claim, that I have the Holy Spirit, that I have God living inside of me. What would they say about that? What if I were able to say, because of Christ's work on the cross, I have perfect righteousness. That is, when God the Father looks down from heaven and sees me, he sees someone as righteous as Jesus, the Son of God. He sees somebody as righteous and as sinless as God. What an amazing thought that is, especially to someone who believed so wholeheartedly that they had to earn their own righteousness. Imagine we can go back and make these claims. We would face persecution too. But look at how Jesus handled the persecution. He was very bold in the face of of the lines of his day. They, they go on to accuse him more. In verse 27, they accuse him of, of not being the Christ based upon where he was from. Look at verse 27. However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. They said, you cannot be the Christ because we know where you're from. Christ is going to come from a place. The Messiah is going to come from a place. And we're not going to have any idea where the Messiah is from. But since we know where Jesus is from, we can pin his birth and his, his place of growing up to a, a certain location. Certainly this cannot be the Christ. What a, what a ridiculous argument. This is in fact a, a straw man argument. If you're familiar with the phrase straw man argument, what a straw man argument is, is you disregard a person's argument completely. You make up uh, something else to attack. And they, and therefore say that the original argument isn't valid because of this other thing that you are attacking having nothing to do with the original argument. Uh, to give you an example, let's say that I said that, uh, that, that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And somebody says, that can't be true because today you're wearing a blue shirt. And anybody who wears blue shirts uh, is an idiot and knows nothing about math. Now, as silly of an argument that, as that is, what they're doing is they're building up a straw man. They're attacking something different, the blue shirt, 
in order to invalidate the argument of 2 plus 2 equals 4. Does that make sense? That's what a straw man argument is. That's what they're doing. They're saying you cannot be the Messiah. They're completely forsaking what he says about himself, what he says about God, uh, what the scriptures say uh, about what the prophet, what the Messiah is going to look like, where he's going to come from, all these things that he's going to go through. They're, they're completely ignoring all these arguments for Jesus being the Messiah. They're setting that all aside and they're attacking where Jesus came from. And they said, we know where you came from, so therefore you can't be the Christ. Completely disregarding what Jesus is saying about himself being from God and being God himself. They, they said that he cannot be the Christ because they know where he is from. Uh, verse 49, his followers will be cursed, they said. They said that he is deceiving people to the point where his followers are going to be accursed. That means they're going to be damned to hell for all eternity. Look at verse 49. But, the, but this crowd who does not know the law is accursed. They're saying this man deceives people. This man healed on a Sabbath. And he's going to teach the people to forsake the Sabbath, to forsake the, the law of Moses, and therefore all of his followers are going to be accursed. Now, you and I, today, we get told by the world all the time, if you're a Christian, you're likely going to be told by the world all the time that you're wrong and you're foolish for giving up such pleasures in life. You're going to have a time where somebody's going to invite you to, to a drink at a bar or, or invite you to partake in some pleasures and you're going to say no and they're going to hold up a bottle of whiskey or champagne or something like that and say really you're going to give this up because you have a book that says to forsake those things. You're following someone who is leading you astray and you're giving up pleasures and they think that that's foolish. And they think that you are being accursed, at least in this life. That your life is going to be wasted because you're giving it to the Lord instead of following the desires of your heart like they are doing. Jim Elliott famously said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. All those pleasures of the world the, the riches of this world, you can't keep those things. The, the relationships of this world, you can't keep those things. He is no fool who gives up those things in order to gain what he cannot lose. And when we give up those things and we obey Jesus, we get more and more of Christ in our life. We get more and more of God in our life. And we cannot lose that. And that lasts for all eternity when drinking and pleasures do not. You are going to be accused of being deceived, of leaving behind pleasures. And it's foolish to do that, they'll say. And it's the same thing that they said in Jesus' day. Lastly, again, verse 52. He is from a place that no prophet has ever come from. In verse 52, he, uh, they said he is from Galilee. And look in the scriptures. No one, had, no prophet of the Old Testament has ever come from the region where Jesus came from. Again, with the straw man argument. Clearly, this man is not, is not only is he not the Christ, but he's not even a prophet, because we know where the prophets have come from. There was hundreds of prophets uh, in, in, the, in the, the, uh, the genealogy of the Old Testament. Not necessarily their, their names are written in the Old Testament. Some of them are, obviously, but not all of them. But apparently, none of the prophets in uh, the time between uh, Abraham to, to Jesus, none of those prophets that rose up ever came from Galilee. So clearly, Jesus is not a prophet either. Now again, with the straw man argument, they're saying it, it doesn't matter what Jesus is arguing about, it doesn't matter what Jesus is saying. All they care about is that he is not from where they think that he should be from if he was indeed the Christ, which is a very silly thing to believe. Let's look at the ways that Jesus handles the lines. Let's look at the ways that Jesus handles these lines. It's very interesting when you look at Jesus' response and a lot that we can learn 
from Jesus' response. First of all, I want you to see that Jesus teaches from the scriptures. That Jesus is always teaching from the scriptures. Verse 14. Jesus is at the temple and he's teaching. And they say, how does this man know letters having never been studied? That means how does he know the scriptures having never been educated in a rabbinical, rabbinical school? He is teaching in the temple from the scriptures. And we know this because this is a theme throughout Jesus' ministry. He is always using the scriptures to confirm what he's doing or what he is teaching. And if you think back to when Jesus was deceived in the, or not deceived, when he was tempted in the wilderness, he was, uh, he was using the scriptures to answer Satan when Satan said, command these stones to become bread. When Satan said, cast yourself off of the height of the temple and angels will catch you. And over and over and over, every time he was accused by Satan, every time he was attempted by Satan, he used the scriptures. Even when Jesus was a boy, uh, he was at the temple reasoning with the, uh, the teachers there from the scriptures. He had a brilliant understanding of the scriptures. And if you look at verses 23 and 24 of John chapter 7, you see Jesus arguing brilliantly from the scriptures. Now this really is a, a fantastic argument and it shows how well Jesus knew the scriptures. There was an accusation that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And because he did that, these Pharisees, they wanted to kill him. Verse 22 of, of John chapter 7 says, Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Now, to remind you, when a Jewish person is born, a Jewish man is born, a Jewish male baby is born, on the eighth day they're to be circumcised. And that's called a brisk, and we still see that today. And it's always on the eighth day. Now, what if that eighth day lands on the Sabbath? Do you forget what the law says about being circumcised on the eighth day? Or do you disregard uh, the rule of the Sabbath? Jesus is saying, you people will circumcise a male baby on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses is not broken. But I, Jesus is saying, am obeying God, the Father, who, who told me, who wanted me to heal a man on the Sabbath. So therefore, how is that a violation of the law if I'm obeying God rather than this very, very strict uh, Sabbath rule that the Pharisees kept? And so you, what we see there is Jesus using profound understanding of Scripture and of the law. And I, and I think there's a lot for us to learn as well about the way that we interact with Scripture. Do you know Scripture well enough to argue from Scripture? Do you know Scripture well enough to interpret the events of your life through the lenses of Scripture? When you go through a hard time, do you know what the Bible is going to say about that? When you go through, through grief, when people accuse you, do you know how to handle it based upon what the scriptures say? One of, one of the most profound accounts of Jesus' love for the scriptures is at the end of his life, he's on the cross. And moments before death, he says, I thirst. Now the passage in John says that he said, I thirst so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Jesus has been dehydrated, through blood loss, is overwhelmed in his thirst. And uh, Psalm 22, I believe, says, My strength has dried up, dried up like a pot shark, referring to uh, Christ being completely overwhelmed by his thirst. And in his tremendous thirst, moments before death, he cried out, I thirst, not to be satisfied, but so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Because there is one prophecy left to fulfill before he died. From, Psalm, from the book of Psalms, I think Psalm 16 says, 
for for they gave me they gave me sour wine to drink. And that was the last prophecy that Jesus had to see fulfilled before he died. So moments before death, he says, I thirst. Not because he wanted to be satiated. Not because he wanted to be satisfied of his thirst, even though it was overwhelming. But because his commitment to the scriptures. So that the scriptures might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. It amazes me how much Jesus loves and adores and uses and reasons from the scriptures. And it's a conviction to me. Do I know the scriptures well? Do I know how to apply them to my life? Do I know how to apply them to, to the people in, in my church's lives? What about you? Do you have a real relationship with the scriptures? Do you know them very well? It's very easy when we, when we go to church for years to say, I've heard it all many, many times. And I don't necessarily need to be studying it every day. I know what the Bible says. I've been in church my entire life, someone might say. But I want to encourage you, if you don't actively seek God in the scriptures on a regular basis, that you need to make that commitment to do so. When you see how beautiful God is, how much he loves you, how much he gave up for you, are you willing to give up five minutes, ten minutes of your day, of your morning, to sit down, quiet your heart, and open up his word, and seek God's face through the scriptures? If you don't normally do that, I want to encourage you to dedicate your life to Jesus in a real and profound way. Not just with good intentions, but for real, seeking God out on a regular basis. Study scripture every day. Build that relationship with it that Jesus had, where he can interpret, he can reason, he can see life through the filter of the scriptures. It's very, very important. How does Jesus handle the lines of his day? He teaches from the scriptures. He has boldness. Verse 26. I'll try to go a little bit quicker here. Verse 26. But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? They were not used to hearing somebody accuse the Pharisees of sin. They were not used to hearing somebody share, boldly share the gospel, the message of how to have eternal life, which only comes through Jesus. They were not used to hearing this boldness. And Jesus was very bold. That is how Jesus handles the lions. He doesn't back down. He is bold. You and I need to be bold in the face of trials in our day, in the face of adversity or opposition to our beliefs today. God is the center of his reasoning and teaching. Verse 29. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Imagine this. Jesus had spent eternity past with God the Father, seeing the splendor and glories of heaven at the right hand of God the Father. He intimately knew all of the events of God because he was there in the beginning when the earth was formed. He saw God interact with every single human person ever mentioned in the scriptures. Of course, God is the center of his reasoning and teaching. But is God the center of your philosophies of life? Is God the center of your reasoning, your understanding of how life works? Do you reflect on God regularly? If not, I want to encourage you again. Have that moment in your day where you spend with the Lord quiet time seeking God's face in the scripture. Best decision you can make for your day. I love this part. Jesus is evangelistic when all eyes are on him. Verse 37, the next day, the day of the great feast, when there is a lot of people all around, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures had said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is a reference to the Holy Spirit, it says, verse 39. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He who believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Referring to the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying to this large crowd, when all eyes are on him, if you believe in me, if you believe in who I am, that I am the Messiah, that I am your Lord, your God, I'm going to die for your sins, 
If you believe in me, you're going to have the Holy Spirit and out of your heart, out of your mouth, excuse me, out of your heart, excuse me, will flow rivers of living water. It means the Holy Spirit will go from you to other people, from them to other people, from them to other people. And living water, the words of life, the gospel truth that saves will come flowing out of your heart. And this is a powerful application to us. Do you share the gospel and all eyes are on you? When you know that you're going through a hard time, do you use it as an opportunity to share? I hope you do. I, I think that God created us to be not just men, but fishers of men. And that's a big part of what it means to live for the Lord, is to share the gospel. And Jesus did that over and over and over when all eyes are on him. Another, another couple things I don't have a, a verse for, but I noticed from this account, Jesus doesn't waver. He doesn't water down the truth. He doesn't say to these Pharisees, oh, you know, you're doing a pretty good job. I'm sure God understands. God wants you to be happy. So, so you know, just don't, don't, don't worry about it. Everything's fine. He doesn't waver in his boldness. He doesn't water down the truth. So what are some applications for us? How can we handle the lions in our life the way Jesus did? When you face trials, whether it's a person accusing you or opposing you because of your faith, or whether it's just a difficult life, whether it's trials, tribulations, adversities, how do you handle the lions of your day? Number one, be bold for the sake of those who will believe in what you're saying and believe because of what you're saying, or those who will be encouraged because of your actions. When you're facing lions, when you're facing adversity, be bold for the sake of those who are going to watch you and see how Christians are supposed to respond to adversity and how they and remember that they are going to be encouraged by your actions. Um, in verse 31, it says that many people believed in Jesus because of his words that day. Remember, when you're facing adversity, people are going to be watching you. I remember a time in, in 2009 when I was a, a part-time youth pastor. I was working for a, uh, a non-profit secular company. And I was working at a teenage boy rehab facility. A rehab facility for teenage males. And they would come in there and get sober. And uh, it, was a, it was a neat job and opportunity to share the gospel with, with many teens. I really appreciated that. I saw uh, several kids come to know Christ. But um, there was, it was 2009, and it was the height of all the drama with Iowa legalizing gay marriage. And in April 2009, uh, the Iowa Supreme Court legalized gay marriage in the state of Iowa. And it was all over the news. I mean, it was all that anybody was talking about. And around that time, I wrote on Facebook, which, which by the way, getting, social, getting into social uh, issues on social media is always going to lead to some problems, but it's a place that we can have some boldness. I, I'm not as bold as I used to be on social media. Uh, I, don't, I don't start arguments that way. I start arguments in person now. Uh, but, uh, but I had written on Facebook that Christians need to not back down in the face of an aggressive homosexuality, homosexual agenda. Uh, that, that it's okay to stand your ground. It's okay to stand upon the Word of God. I wrote something like that on Facebook. And unbeknownst to me, there was a woman who worked with me that was a lesbian. And I didn't realize that she was a lesbian. And she got so mad that I had wrote this. And she, she brought it up with, with our bosses and they, they sat me down and talked to me about, uh, about you know, not, uh, not being sensitive and not being tolerant and all these things. And, uh, you know, I tried my best to, to, to get out of that situation and say, you know, I'm sorry I offended people. It was not my intention. I, I'm, a, I'm a youth pastor. I, I have uh, Christians that, that look to me, that listen to me. I wanted to write something for, for our side as well. And uh, anyway, they, they let that go, but that wasn't enough for this, for this woman. Uh, she, she wanted blood. And she went to the CEO of the company, who was himself a homosexual and uh, openly gay man, and he brought the hammer down on me. He said that I had so many months to, to, to meet all these requirements. I had to read a book on uh, the, the difficulty of, 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 of being openly gay 
in America. I had to meet with the professor of diversity at Iowa State because uh, we were living in Ames at the time. Um, I had to, uh, to, to write a, an essay retracting my statement and uh, retracting my belief that homosexuality was biblically wrong. And, uh, you know, I tried writing something like that. I, I wrote something that said, you know, I believe in the power of words. And I need to be very sensitive. And, and that was enough. They, they wanted a genuine recant, recantion of my beliefs. And, uh, and it, was, it was a difficult time for me. And I will never forget, first of all, how it was resolved was uh, the, the church I was working for part-time ended up taking me on as full-time. So I was able to quit that job. I didn't need it anymore. And uh, so the Lord worked out in that way. But what I will never forget is how many Christians that I worked with said, thank you for not recanting. Thank you for not backing down. They were encouraged by the fact that I tried to get along with everybody. I tried to live at peace with everybody. But I also wasn't going to back down from my beliefs and, and from my, the statement that I had made publicly on Facebook. And I'll never forget that there's always people that are watching us. As we go through our trials, as we go through our adversity, as we go through our life, there's Christians that are watching you all the time, not waiting for you to fail, like the world watches, but they, they watch waiting to see how a Christian is supposed to respond to this. And it's those people that you have to remember in the face of your adversity. If you go through something big, a big trial, a death of a child, a death of a, a spouse, a death of a parent, if you go something, through something that's just huge, Remember, there's Christians that are watching you. You can use this as an opportunity to witness. You could say, hey, praise God. God never makes mistakes. It is sad, but God's going to carry me through this. And for the sake of those watching you, be a bright witness. That's what I see Jesus doing. That's how we should apply this passage to our life today. Secondly, satisfaction comes from the Lord and not from men. If you're looking to the opinions of man for satisfaction... When men's opinions of you are failing in the face of adversity, you are going to be sorry. If you tie your satisfaction to the opinions of men and not to the Lord, you're always going to be left hurting. You're always going to be left in pain. Satisfaction is supposed to come from the Lord. Jesus said that out of your hearts will flow rivers of living water. And that has a reference to Jeremiah 2.13. Which says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, Jesus is the fountain of living water, and these people are looking to broken cisterns of stagnant water that can hold no water to find satisfaction. And there is nothing satisfying about that. Last week, we looked at a gentleman named William Somerset Morgan who at the end of his life, though he had millions and millions of dollars in the 1930s, was absolutely miserable. He had every luxury, every pleasure that life could offer, and he was miserable. And he ended up uh, dying in a way where he thought he saw a demon or he saw the devil coming for his soul. And he was screaming at the moment of his death. In his autobiography, about the philosophies of his life, he wrote these words. The beauty of life is nothing but this, that each should act in conformity with his nature and business. The beauty of life is nothing but this, that each should act in conformity with his nature and business. In other words, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. In other words, if it feels good, do it. Do whatever your nature tells you, even though your heart is sinful. Do whatever feels good. And, and he lived his life by this philosophy. It was the last line of his own autobiography. And in the end, he was absolutely miserable. And he lost his life. And he went to hell because he didn't know God. He didn't look to God for satisfaction. Satisfaction comes from God, not from pursuing our own lust. The story of Daniel in the lion's den is actually not a story of Daniel in the lion's den at all. It is the story of the lions in Daniel's den because the power didn't reside in the muscles and in the claws and the teeth of the lions. The power resided in God who was behind Daniel. 
So the lions had their mouths shut by God. The account of Jesus in the lion's den is the account of the lions in Jesus' den. And never forget who it is that has your back. Your story, you may be facing lions in this life, you may be facing trials and tribulations and adversity, things that are just huge. But you're not facing them alone. You're facing them with the almighty God who has your back. And quickly, before we close, I want to read to you this one passage of scripture that describes who it is that has your back. Revelation 1, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of those seven lampstands, that's referring to the church, one like the Son of Man. Listen to this. Clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were like were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who was, or I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death and Hades with me. That is who has your back in the face of adversity. That is your Savior. Praise God for the mighty power that you and I have to face the lines of our day. What a, an amazing privilege it is to serve an almighty God like that. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your work in our lives. Thank you for being with us in the face of adversity. If there's anybody who's listening to this, who, who is going through adversity, I pray, God, you give them boldness and strength to know that God is with them and no weapon that is fashioned against them shall stand. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening.